Hello, everybody. It is your host, Dr. Goons, here on the Jobbers and Goons channel. And today we have a very special guest, a uh, critically acclaimed writer. He has written some of my favorite material ever, included Midnighter, and he is the current architect behind Scarlet Witch. My buddy, Steve Orlando, if you want to say what's up. Hey, uh, what's up? It's good to see everyone, or at least uh, auditorily see everyone. That's not what ears do, but just assume that what I said made sense. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And today we are going to be talking me. about... Me. It, is, it only has to make sense for you. That's how this works. And we're, we're really going to be talking about some of his modern work. Um, I am, you guys know me, I will be sneaking in a couple topics about Midnighter. But regardless, the first thing I want to talk about, because my channel really took off when I started covering more Doctor Doom materials. One of the funniest characters to ever exist. I've read all his appearances. And when I saw him in the Darkhold crossover, I, I was very excited. I was like, you know, we're going to get some Doom action, especially mixing it with Elder Gods. You can't ask for much more. And I want I want to know, with such a grandiose character, with such flavor in Doctor Doom, what was it like approaching the story working with his character? It's intimidating. Doom is... You know, protected by by Marvel, very you know, we're pre pretty pretty strongly compared to other characters, it, and that's and that's not unusual um, <clears throat> in franchises. Like you know, you know, not everybody gets to work on Doom, not ever, or at least without like really showing your work and and presenting your case. Not everybody gets to work on Yoda. You know, like there there are certain characters just the, the people do, publishers do studios do a lot of work to protect their mystique and maintain their mystique so not you can't just like do a one-off out of nowhere doom story where you know, you know he gets his ass handed to him by squirrel girl more than once of course um and so it's intimidating you know like you have to create a story that essentially rises to the level of the character um, and that's why even though Doom does get his comeuppance in Darkhold, there, we were sure to give him moments as well. And of course, things that only he can do, right? Like, this is the guy that faced down the Beyonders in Secret Wars. So once we realized that the original Darkhold was going to drive ever, any human mad that read it, we also immediately knew that there was only one person on the planet that could read it with no problem. And it would obviously be Doom. Um, so, I mean, his will is, you know, he might be uh, a scotch less intelligent, uh, in the grand scheme than Reed Richards and pain to admit that, but I would argue that his will is probably even stronger and maybe the strongest in the Marvel universe. So, um, you know, again, it's intimidating, but you gotta, if he's an antagonist, yes, he, you know, the, he may not win the day, but he's got to, uh, in wrestling terms, he's got to look strong in defeat, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because, you know, we use... My channel's Jobbers and Goons. You know, we, I cover jobber-like characters all the time. If we're talking Marvel, it's definitely Silver Surfer or Nightcrawler. Not naming other names, but those are my two prime examples. And Silver Surfer, jobber? That dude's got the power cosmic. Well, that, that's a that's a different discussion. We'll I'll come back on. For I can, there's plenty of power cosmic victims. Uh, we, <laughs> we, there's a lot of yeah. Surfer like literally when he first appeared to Ben Grimm, got knocked out, and like his you just see in the panel his ass sticking in the air as like he's just out cold surfer's been choked out by regular humans like he gets into a lot of you he gets into a lot of situations where he's just putting people over for no reason like damn surfer you have all this you're supposed to fight back on paper um so he's he's definitely a funny character to refer to as a jobber now doom on the other hand isn't ever really used in that manner and i think that's important in storytelling because in his, in terms of you know referencing Darkhold, when he was taking down, I felt like that was a perfect demonstration of the threat we're dealing with. Like even the characters who want to see him lose were like, "All right, Doom just doesn't get his ass kicked like this." Well, clearly, what we're dealing with is some next level stuff. And is that was that kind of your approach with Doom? Like, hey, if anyone's going to show you how strong something is, let's put Doom in this kind of situation. 
Well, yeah, and to be clear, he's still, you know, like, it's like, it's like keep Roman strong, man. Like, like, yes, of course, like, we established the, the scale of Cthon because he does, you know, like, Doom can't survive in his realm, but he also makes it back, which almost no one else could do, right? So, even in defeat, he still is, is one of the toughest guys out there, and, um... Yeah, I mean, listen, the, the the storytelling mechanics of pro wrestling are actually very similar to the storytelling mechanics of comics. So, you know, Kathan has been around for a long time, but not around recently. Having him uh, terror and his and his realm terrorize Doom, you know, that that's the Goldberg return where he squashed uh, Brock Lesnar in 2016, right? We don't want to talk about what happened after, of course, uh, but like <laughs> that's the moment. That's the that that's the that's the shock moment, and the thing is, is that like that only matters when, just like in wrestling, uh, your villains and your antagonists are protected. You know, like the first time Mongol came back after um, for the Man Who Has Everything, it was like shocking. Same with the Anti Monitor. Same with like you know his return in Sinestro Core War. Um, and, and since then, the, the more someone gets beaten without getting some wins, the, they, they get devalued, just like, in, just like in wrestling or just like in sports when someone goes in, or I should say shoot sports, uh, when someone goes on a losing streak. So, yeah, the philosophy is exactly the same, right? you got to make an opening statement. you got to set the stakes. Um, and at the same time, like, you can't just completely job a, a guy like Doom out. Uh, he still survived something almost no one else in the Marvel Universe could. Uh, so, so even in defeat, right? So it's it's very much the, uh, the, the a similar philosophy. But I think that's why when it works, um, I mean that's why those moments in wrestling do work, right? Like nobody, uh, despite what some people at the, at that one company say about wins and losses not mattering, they do matter. Uh, yes, they yeah, do matter. I agree. Uh, um, they may not matter as much as some people think, but they matter. You know, rest in peace, because I think he was a creative genius. But how many wild speeches can can Bray give, or could Bray give, to uh, resuscitate his character when he never fucking won, uh, right? And it would, and he's one of the, was one of the most creative people in the business of all time, in my opinion. But it, he would have reached even more heights if he actually fucking won sometimes. Uh, you know, instead of doing the heavy lifting to revive himself just with a killer promo or a new angle or things like that. So. Um, I think the logic is true, honestly, in, in nearly every storytelling sense across many mediums. Yeah, and on the magic side for Marvel, I think that's important too because it kind of establishes the hierarchy or what to expect, like heading into it. For example, um, Baron Mordo and Marvel is an absolute jobber. I've seen him prep for literally eternity, run up on Doctor Strange in his house and immediately get sent into oblivion. There was not even a fight. I don't I don't remember Strange even looking at him. It was very embarrassing. But we also know that when someone a caliber of Mordo is defeated by someone, if it's not the usual people beating him up, it, it does matter. And to me, the way you were using characters to kind of demonstrate the Cathon because for those that don't know, and he uh, Steve kind of brought this up, Cthon isn't as mainstream of a Hell Lord or Eldritch being in Marvel. In fact, like you said, we don't see him that much. So I'm kind of curious, uh, what was your approach with Cthon? Like being able to flesh out more of his story, who he is, like the fact that how he created the Darkhold out of another Elder God, it kind of got him banished. We. The Marvel cosmology can sometimes be confusing, especially with uh, the different Hell Lords and the landscape of that. So I'm kind of what's your take on Cthon, especially when you're heading into the run? I mean, we wanted to, you know, he, he is a powerful character um, at the same time. As you said, things are very complicated. Everything in comics is complicated, especially I mean, like Wanda's family. Her quote unquote, uh, I mean, her extended family is one of the most buck wild ones in comics. Uh, you know, it's 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 strange in a world of strange families. So, um, with Cthulhu, it was kind of like, look, he's always kind of been his. He's been, you know, he he, he tainted her soul or whatever uh, from the time she was born. She was always supposed to be this vessel for him to take over eventually, and all this. And he's always kind of been a stand-in in many ways, like a, a metaphorical stand-in for Wanda's struggles with mental health. Uh, and so we wanted to, we knew with Darkhold and Trilo Magneto that we wanted to sort of uh, put close, not close the book, 
turn the uh, write the final page of this of, of a lot of long, one is long-standing chapters her issues with the mutants her issues with the darkhold and Cathan. so when he came back the focus we didn't want to get too mired down in the lore not that we contradicted anything but the key is that the important things are how he relates to wanda you know his you know what he's done to wanda how he's plagued her life how he sees her uh in a different way than she sees herself of course he's wrong in how he sees her she's just a thing to him um and how that's eventually his downfall but the idea was yes to bring him in and have him make this big push and of course to show how his world and power can corrupt others as you see with the dark hole defiled but then to knowing that he's been sort of uh that 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 stand-in for wanda's own internal struggles uh, you know, anyone who has, has been to therapy, anyone who's struggled with mental health knows that, you know, the, the, it, there's very rarely like a quote-unquote cure. There's, there's management. There's, there's finding ways to, to integrate these, these uh, struggles into your life, and, and if you can, turn them into a positive. So um, with Cathan, that's why you see that she ultimately, she realizes that her issue has been that she's tried to destroy him time and time again, but she can't. Uh, he's a fundamental, you know, being. He's part of reality. Uh, he's the elder god of chaos. And chaos is one of the oldest, you know, powers in, in creation. So she has to do something else. And that's how we got around to the moment where she transmutes the dark hold and chains him inside her soul. And now, you know, she has this living avatar for the chaos in her life that she's always got to kind of manage and, and, and try to keep control of. Now, how has she been doing with that? Like, stay tuned. In the upcoming Scarlet Witch stuff, we've already seen a couple hints. But yes, like our, our approach was focus on, you know, focus on the relationships, the character dynamics between them and give folks as much of the lore as they need. Uh, but not so much that you're kind of wrapped up wondering, you know, where, how old he is and, and, and who his brother is and how he relates to Set or Gaia and things like that. Um, that's a great story, but it wasn't this story. You know, this is the story of Wanda overcoming. Yeah, and... For sure, I could see those questions did kind of pop up for me. But again, we're dealing with right away. We don't know if the defiled are going to recover. Um, we don't know how that's going to play out. We're dealing with and and she has to deal with this too. One major rule, and you honored it beautifully, is you don't typically get a second chance against Dr. Doom. Like if you beat him, cool, but you, you better kill him. And he pretty much said that. He was like, yeah, no, Katan's an idiot for not killing me. Because now when he comes back, I will be ready and it's it's going to be over for him. And I think that was like and a beautiful did, catalyst. You know, like and, you know, he was willing to work with Wanda. The thing I like about Doom is that, like, he's an antagonist, but I don't even know if I would call him. No, he's probably he has probably evil tendencies, but he's not like what I think is fascinating about him is there's plenty of times where Doom sees the bigger picture, right? Like he wants to rule the world. Uh, or I should say he thinks that he's best suited to um but he doesn't want to destroy it so you have moments like yes doom would work with wanda to take out kathan doom would work with the heroes you know going back to things like uh onslaught like to you know like even if tony did have to rope him into that like he th that complexity i mean he's one of the first characters to have that and now like i think a lot of people when they revamp villains are chasing that level of complexity where yes he's an antagonist but his he's not it's not as though he wants to destroy the planet or even eradicate its people um it's 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 more complex than that so he is he you know he will stand with people who might be enemies the next day for him because he is capable of seeing the bigger picture and that's not true of every antagonist marvel has uh yeah, but I do think it's true of him, and I think, yeah, you see, you know, like, he was happy to work with Wanda, but of course his ego also means that he could never imagine Wanda would screw him after she's done using him, right? Like, she couldn't imagine that someone would deign to use him like she, he uses everyone else. So, and that's always been his fault, you know? Like, look at Secret Wars. All he has to, I mean, it all comes down, reality itself comes down to him admitting that Mr. Fantastic would have done a better job with the same power than him. That's kind of all there is for him like and, and i think that's fascinating yeah it's all i mean it's always been a big part of his character and i think what makes him amazing in that regard too is he has been in a lot of ways um, made to be proven right about his value to the world for example best best case i can think of with this is when panther god himself 
viewed the world and who would be best to rule everything, including uh, the assets of Wakanda. And he saw, yes, technically, humanity's greatest king or greatest hope to survive in a great world would be Doctor Doom. And he's looked at as this terrible being. But when you go to his country, there's often times where they're like, hey, there's no crime here. Everyone's fed. Everyone's happy. It's almost as if his ego, his ego needs something to rule. Like being king is cool, but you have to rule something. And that principle is not alien to Dr. Doom's character. And it sets him up because immediately he was, he had no worries about Kathan in terms of before the first fight, of course. Like he was like, no, I can go take, he even considers an elder god his rival, which should be crazy. Like any other human saying that shit, you're like, all right. You're just full of it. But I was like, okay, maybe Dr. Doom would have an Elder God as a rival. This is the same guy that slapped Mephisto in his own realm. So, yeah, I mean, he slapped Mephisto. He stole, he stole the power cosmic. He, I mean, he's, he's recreated reality by staring down the Beyonders. Like, Doom is a lot of things, but afraid almost never happens. Yeah, uh, and I, I thought that was one of the coolest lines, too, when you, um, <laughs> it was funny as hell that he refused to tell them what actually happened. That was a very doom move of him, but he he said, you know, the forces of Cathan met the unbridled resolve of Latveria. And that is something I I immediately associate with Doom, you know. That's what makes him such a badass. Like when he said he was gonna hold the line against the mad celestial, you know, how much time do you need? That's just who he is. He's not gonna back down, win or lose. I, the only way you can really get the drop on him is to just be overwhelmingly powerful to the point he didn't expect it which is kind of what happened there and to play on his ego i mean i think that's uh, the mad celestial thing is that that's a great i mean that's what's special about him he'll do that you know and then once the world is safe he'll turn around and stab reed in the heart you know uh like like once, once he can get back to his his own personal projects of of settling a college vendetta with the entire world on the line um, but until then, yeah, I mean, he's that guy. I think that if there's ever someone that is going to walk out from behind a wall and, and get one up on the supposed villain of a story, it's, it's going to be doom. Right. So I, and, and I would, you know, I think that's, what's very, always been special about him. Look, he's the guy that inspired Dar one of the guys that inspired Darth Vader. Um, yeah, I know, I mean, you right? get in the conversation right there. You inspired one of the goats. Like <laughs> that, that's, it is what it is. Although the irony is that I don't think Doom would actually like Darth Vader because Doom is not, I mean, Doom with his ethnic background is not so into genocide, actually, which is like Darth Vader's big thing. So, but that's a digression for a crossover that will never happen. Oh, yeah, he, um, Doom, Doom wouldn't like any of them. Doom doesn't like many people anyway, so that that's already a burden. Um, when working with, um, Scarlet Witch, a lot of references are made, um, to her just her power uh, from a pure power standpoint for example it's referenced you know how she's just blatantly got the better of strange sometimes because she's just stronger and i'm curious in terms of her power level right now did the dark hole binding make her stronger or is she just tapping the power she's already had Uh, well, look, this is a question that has been asked on social media, and it's a complicated question. You know, when people... It's not power she already had, but it's also not Dragon Ball Z, you know, not to seem flippant. Um, you know, which... Sometimes it kind of feels like folks think that the, the world, or, or quote-unquote the real world, you know, that is reflected by within Marvel, especially Marvel, because it's always been the world outside your window is it runs like things like that you know like oh i ate i don't know fucking uh, name your I, I ate the silver surfer now i have the silver surfer's power but that's not always how things work so like the adult answer is that i think she is more powerful but it doesn't mean she has more bonk power right like she has agency over in her life for the first time uh in a long time um, she's no longer worried, you know, about this creep uh, uh, of Cathan into her soul and things like that. That being said, yes, he's still stuck inside her soul. She has to expend some of her conscious mind all the time, making sure he stays in there. And she's been bottling him up. Now, is that the smart thing to do? Uh, stay tuned for Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. 
but um, so I would say she is more powerful, but it's not necessarily the like back of a stats card. Like if you're looking at a Marvel stats card, I don't know that her like energy projection is higher, but her intelligence and stamina and all those other things are higher. Like if you want to get into the 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 stats of it all, they've certainly improved. But it's not necessarily her blasting power, if that makes sense. I mean, she's got plenty of that anyway, by the way. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that needed any kind of zhuzh. Yeah, I agree with that. Like um, initially. And a lot of times we even see it in comics when a character is absorbed or someone's power is absorbed, it would be an amp. But at the same time, uh, it, it's like made blatantly clear this is a power she's dealt with almost every waking moment. The only difference now is she can embrace it. Uh, she can chain it away. Uh, she can make it a part of her instead of because like like you said and like it says in the story, she she literally can't destroy uh, Cathan. It's just not possible. So it she while can. she's uh, she can, although stay tuned for someone who might be able to uh, this year. But I guess that's the only tease I can give. Hey, if you read Timeless, you already know who it is. But anyway, oh yeah, okay, okay, that makes sense. But the the notion that she got it, it was a little weird to just assume she got stronger reading it because at the same time it seemed more of a maturity, um, like that power she she's always been a powerhouse she's always had this natural uh, abundance of magic i mean strange is someone who has dealt with pretty much every magical obstacle in creation and he even acknowledges like yeah if we're just talking raw power no one's really messing with scarlet that she just has it and so i i didn't i was going as far as thinking this might even be a slight debuff cuz the concept of having Cathan within you that's just hard to keep under wraps I mean we saw even in the other realm that you know Cathan's constantly struggling against the binds that had him there so I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked if it wasn't a buff I'm glad you cleared it up but it's it's one of those things where said, it's you, complicated you do it though. that being said like Wanda is Wanda really doing the job of management uh well that's something that comes up in scarlet witch and quicksilver you know without getting too much into it because it's not out yet like she isn't always right uh and it certainly seems like she thinks she is throughout the first 10 issues um and she's almost toxically confident and the thing is is that like there's well as you'll see and as some people have caught on like there's an element of overcompensating, right? She's been not fine for so long, now she's desperate to seem fine all the time. Uh, but she's not really finding a positive outlet for what she's holding inside. She's really just caging it up, as we've seen. So, and and the cracks are starting to show, right? We saw that Agatha was able to sneak in. Granted, it took this giant multiversal fight to distract her long enough for Agatha to sneak in and steal Cathan's heart, um, which he doesn't really need anyway. It's magic, it's symbolic. Uh, he's he's an elder god. He, it's not like he was born on Earth and has pumping blood or anything. Um, but you'll see that the stuff we're talking about comes to bear in Scarlet Witch. Like she she maybe hasn't had the W in totality that she thinks she has. Um, but you only have to wait like a month to see that. So I won't go into it too much more. Yeah, and I mean that's a that's a very good plug too. Make sure y'all tune in for that as well as checking out all the materials we are talking about if you have not read it already. Now, for you, what someone who picked up Scarlet Witch and you've been pioneering her lore updates and her current character, what as opposed to other characters you worked with, what interested you about Scarlet Witch heading into the project? I think, you know, it's paradoxical because her actual raw power level, as we've discussed, is quite high. But uh, on a, that being said, I think Wanda is one of the most relatable people in like the top tier of Marvel comics, you know, because of the same, because despite all that power, like, here's the thing. Um, all that power means is that the scale of her struggles is different and maybe like the way they look is different. However, when you get right down to it, uh she's she's imperfect she's fallible she's made very real mistakes on a scale that we can't we'll never i mean most humans never could do or commit to um and she's overcome them and it's been real work so even though she has this uh, phenomenal cosmic power 
Her journey, I think, has been one of the most humans in comics. Who among us hasn't haven't fucked up? Who among us, you know, wish there was a quick solution? How many times do all we all do that, right? And and that's even a line that um, comes from Darcy, uh, which we'll see in Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver One. It's not a spoiler, as, so like, you know, Wanda says that she thought that she had put her anger behind her, and she after this big moment and she's a little shaken by it and she's like you know like i i thought that i was done with all this and it's darcy that has to say like well you know like you were and now you're not like people slip up you know it you know people make mistakes and then they get right back on track that's how that's what it is to be human and so even though it's wild right because wanda could snap and turn every pencil in the world into a snake if she wanted to um she could turn the moon into soup like darcy loves to say uh, even though, like, the tapestry of her mistakes looks different than ours, I think the way she's dealt with them and the way her life has gone is, uh, some of the most human storytelling that has really happened, uh, in comics and in Marvel comics. Like, her struggles are just like us. Her problems are just like ours. But the scale of them and the lens through which we see them, the wildness of comic books, and I think that that's special, you know? Like, everybody's family is strange, right? Um, Wanda's family is strange too. Uh, the difference is, of course, is that it's comic book strange. So even though you know, all of us probably have a weird uncle or a weird cousin, uh, you know, she's got her ex-husband who was a robot who took her brainwaves and made her use them to make his new wife, who's also a murderer and also dead, uh, and then merged them to make their daughter and their son, one of whom is still alive and is kind of her daughter, but kind of not because it was made again from a clone robot with brainwaves. And I could say that all without taking a breath. Uh, and that's just one wing of her family, right? So, like, I do really love that, like, Wanda is just like us, but through this kaleidoscopic lens that is the, the wildness of comic books. I, I, could, I could definitely see that, especially with um, the way she, like you said, you can, you can see the, even though it's dealing with an elder god, you can, uh, you can see the parallel between her mental health struggles and battling an elder god. And I want to touch on an aspect to the story that I loved, which was the five, the five defenders of the dark hole. Now, going into the lore of that, just curious, why the five characters from Marvel? Why did you choose them? Like, what was the process behind that? I thought they were great selections, but I, I think it'd be interesting to hear how you went about picking the five you did. Uh, I mean, look, I can't lie to you. Like, we're, you know, with most big event casts or even many event casts, um, there's a combination of um, like a, a commercial commercial thought and creative thought. So like, yes, I shouldn't surprise anyone that Spider-Man was there because Spider-Man is a draw. Um, but then at the same time, like it, it's like half that and half the other thing. Which characters do I love? That's why Black Bolt was there. Um, so, you know, we had characters that folks, uh, the, the, you know, of course, editors say, hey, like, the, you know, can this person might work, especially when you're building something from the ground up, which we were. That's not a problem. Uh, but then, of course, people like Black Bolt, um, people like Wasp, like these are characters that I love. So you 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 get a little bit of both in the mix. And, and that's a fine uh, time to do it, because, again, when you're building a story from brick one, uh, that type of input is great. Um, it may seem a little commercial at first, but it's really not because to be frank, we want people to read these stories and to read them, they got to get their attention there and they have to be bought to be read. So, um, you know, so, again, it's about half input, uh, like especially Spider-Man and Tony Stark or Iron Man rather, those are the big ones. Um, and then the rest were like, which characters do we think would be fun for this? Who do we want to see fighting with Wanda? Who do we want to see getting a strange dark hold form? Uh, and when you're starting from page one, panel one, uh, the impetus is sometimes just as simple as that, like uh, wh whimsy and, and creativity and uh, and things you want to see as a reader and a creator, of course. Yeah, I, lo I thought um, that makes sense with Wasp because I was, I was, you. we don't get to see Wasp get much spotlight like, uh, like that, especially modern times. So seeing her on the team, was awesome. I loved Spider-Man was the fool um, and compared to the historical nature of the five. Uh, Blade was another one 
I thought made sense. Like if anyone's going to have some potential ancient meaning to dealing with some threat from hell, Blade would be a damn good candidate, um, especially in the modern era. In terms of Black Bolt, how hard is it working with Black Bolt? The man can't speak. <laughs> so, like, uh, how's your approach with Black Bolt as a character, especially incorporating him in such a major event? Uh, listen, I love the Inhumans, uh, and I love Black Bolt. So, yes, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge I was willing to get into because I... Um, well, to be quite frank, like it was the first thing I, other than working with the Scarlet Witch, when we knew we wanted to do a Darkhold event, um, the second thing was, um, I, if this is my only Marvel thing, which it might have been at the time, it was my first Marvel work uh, that I wrote, even though it was the second thing to come out. Um, uh, like I, I had to get Black Bolt in because he's one of my favorite characters. Um, but the challenge of him speaking. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is, uh, it's not uh, It's not an impossible mountain to climb, as you saw. I think there's another Doom moment, of course, that was great. Like, he speaks That was in, amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> he speaks in a human sign language, and Tony needs to translate it. But, of course, Doom already knows it, you know? Um, so it's just about finding creative ways, especially when Medusa is not there to speak for him. But that's part of the fun. And, of course, he does talk a little bit uh, in, in devastating fashion in the book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a fun challenge. I love the character. I love a character with immense power that also presents a hurdle for them, right? So him not being able to speak because of his power, I've always thought has been very compelling. Yeah, I, I was a big fan of the Inhuman, uh, Inhuman run. I think it came out in like 2000, 2001, around that range. Uh, I thought it did well to establish the mystique behind him not speaking. Just there's almost power in that because when he speaks everything goes to shit for everybody else um and kind of flip not flipping over but going back to kathan um because again this was a character we finally got more info on if we were to look at the grand scheme of marvel where would you say someone like a kathan would sit because they Marvel's done stories before where they've literally had the Hell Lords and Hell Beings at a table, kind of talking about where they all match up to each other, like how the hierarchy works. Is he is he a, a god that kind of stands independent of that, like beyond creation, just kind of doing his own thing? Is he someone that potentially one day we could see woven into the fabric of the different chaotic beings? Uh, what's his stature right now? Uh, well, right now he's in a cage in Wanda's soul. Okay, that's fair. I walked into that. But, <laughs> but in terms of his, um, I guess we'd say before that, technically speaking. Uh, well, I mean, look, I'll, I'll admit, like, the, it, you couldn't know this, but I, I, I'm hesitant to answer because, and I, and I probably won't, uh, just because, unfortunately, whatever I say about this is going to be used by fans online to inflame abuse and and, viol and violence towards other fans, which is an unfortunate thing to say, but anything related, this has been what like power level and, and, and cosmic hegemony discussions have become in comics. So I'm not trying to be unromantic, but I don't, I mean, I, I don't answer the, I, I, it's, it's become too dangerous either with people harassing me, threatening my life, threatening to cut my hands off um, or threatening other fans who disagree with them if, if I answer anything regarding uh, actual cosmogony, Wanda's specific power level, Kathan's power level, you know, it, it's unfortunate. And I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm just, you know, I got to speak truth to this. Yeah, I can I, I can adjust the question uh, too. Not really a power level a question. Lot, no. no, I mean, to be frank, like I'm happy to talk about it. Like a, a what I assume is a variety of few fans who are extremely toxic and make violent threats towards creators and other fans have poisoned the pot for everybody. It's not safe you know, I don't do interaction with people on Twitter anymore because um, abuse and purposely mis purposely misread takes have, have been framed as constructive criticism and they just lead to abuse of other fans, abuse to fellow creators, uh, and, and it's unfortunate. But 
um, you know, we have to be the adults in the room. I'm not going to, you know, it's, it's one thing if people want to come for me, but I'm not going to say something that can then be quoted on social and used for one section of, of Wanda fandom and Marvel fandom to attack another section of, war, of, of Marvel fandom, whether it's a Wanda fan on Wanda fan or Wanda fan on Gene fan. Um, I think not enough of us talk about this. Like these folks have, have, have turned this into something that is, is not healthy. Uh, and it does kind of ruin it for folks who just want to, you know, ask these questions like you. Uh, that, you know, like I, and it operates, unfortunately, from you, many times that like I, I, I become compassionate and, and somewhat naive. And I think if I just show enough patience, then, then you know, folks will get it. But they don't. You That's know, a like mistake. When you, when you, <laughs> you, um, you know, and a good example is, you know, there's a large portion of, or not a large, I have no idea. There's a portion of folks who think that because Wanda's power comes from chaos magic, which is one of the foundational things in the universe, uh, in the Marvel universe, um, that she should never face any struggles and never be untouchable, or she, or rather she should be untouchable. And, and they don't understand how something like low Mysterium could affect her because chaos magic is older than Mysterium and it's older than the white hot room, uh, if it is. Uh, and, and the thing is like, that's just a false assumption. Uh, every, nearly everything in creation has hydrogen in it. As I've said online, nearly everything in any organic thing in creation has carbon in it. But if you have a sheet of carbon uh, and you have a, th a steel bar which is, has carbon in it, guess what? That steel bar can break that sheet of carbon. The idea that something being old or a building block to something else means it cannot be affected by that thing is just a false uh, misunderstanding of, of how reality works. And, you know, comics are still uh, an interpretation of reality. And I said this online once and someone said to me, well, you're an idiot because... Uh, everybody knows that even chaos magic was older than carbon and carbon came from chaos magic and i and that is when i learned that i just have to close up shop on the internet and step away because that's a silly thing to say um but so i'm hesitant to answer it and 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 it's and it's nothing that you've asked but i'm just you know i want to give people context like because it's a real problem uh i think many creators wish we could interact with readers more but um it's just not become it, it's just not it's become not safe uh in a lateral sense to other readers uh, and fans and of course like you know we don't get paid a lot to make up these stories in our living rooms we definitely don't need the ad and added bonus of having people threaten to come to our house and kill us or cut our hands off because we wrote a comic book so um to answer your question <laughs> uh Kithon, we've actually talked about this off camera before so it's like i can't disagree with you we literally had this discussion in dms i think we we're dealing with like emma frost hate and i was like steve you're way too nice i'll be dirty about but, this. <laughs> but, I'll, say this. I'll, but I'll say this like kathon is one of the elder gods and uh you know, let me speak about it in a way that is that is connected to what's going on now like Kithan is one of the elder gods, and we know that they are immensely powerful. Like, he is probably, and I'm saying probably because I'm sure there's an issue somewhere in the past 85 years that would contradict it, but... Yeah, you speak with you freedom at, on my channel. I'll protect you from all But if you, if you look at things like, if you look at things like what's going on in Immortal Thor right now, we know yes. that the elder gods, aka... aka the yeah, Tornos and that, yeah. Uh, are even older and even more powerful than what we know as the gods of the Marvel Universe. And Kathan is one of them. You know, he might be stuck okay. in Wanda's soul. Yeah, but, that's what I was kind uh, of trick because the elder god term in Marvel for decades has been thrown around sometimes. Um, but in, and you beautifully referenced it, I've been covering Immortal Thor um, on my channel. The elder god title has become more firm, if that makes sense. Like, there is indeed... Um, a true fleshed out uh, host of elder gods and that's and i know he was referenced multiple times in your run as an elder god so that's kind of what i was wondering is he obviously his condition right now is completely different than some of the other other elder gods but i was curious if that's like the pantheon he's a part of uh yeah you know how that fits in uh to what's going on in immortal uh well you know uh, al and i talk usually at least once a week. So like, like, like we uh, keep an eye on what's going on in Scarlet Witch and we'll see what goes on uh, in, in Immortal Thor. But yes, I think that, that uh, that's an easy assumption to make. Um, you know, the Elder God stuff has been built out by Al and um, we're trying to be right in line with that.
<laughs> it's man it's so funny you went on the power scaling rant because i just i well, last week i released a rant video on people taking that shit too serious <laughs> so that was actually i know you didn't do it on purpose but i was very well timed um by the way you tell al ewing whenever he wants to stop by and talk about his current run i'm all for it i don't i i'm trying to get writers on the channel so hard because of y'all schedule which i completely understand but yeah if he ever had time you let him know all four i've been covering that run thoroughly and using power scaling to segue into something now we're not really talking about power scaling but fuck it i want to talk about midnighter you wrote one of my fate i've read every midnighter appearance and you genuinely wrote one of my favorite runs ever with your take on midnighter as he was for those at home that don't know, he was kind of acclimated into the DC landscape, uh, which could be very tricky, especially taking them from another property. And I want to know from you, what was it like working with Midnighter? That would be probably my dream character to write. So like heading it, because Midnight is such a unique character, especially with how Bob Gardens introduced and all that in the DC landscape. Just looking back on that, what was it like working with the goat Midnighter? I mean, uh, it, you know, uh, listen, I grew up reading that book and it was my first major work at DC. Uh, so, and I, much like I was talking about with, um, uh, with Scarlet Witch, like I wrote that series, like it might be the only time I ever work in comics, right? So, um, and especially for a character that is so close to my heart, it, it's hugely intimidating. It's super exciting. Never mind it being your first, easy, you know, big two work. I had worked in comics before. I'd worked at, uh, and I had worked at Vertigo, and I'd worked at Image, uh, um, a couple times actually. Uh, but my first, like, quote unquote, ongoing or uh, a thing at DC, or at least long form, lar long format project. Um, you know, and you just want to, you want to do it justice. You want to re, you know, create new moments that you hope give people the feeling you had when you discovered a character uh, and why to love them, you know? So that was the hope with Midnighter. Um, I, issue three is still one of my favorite issues I've written. Uh, so it's still, it's still on my heart, I promise. But yeah, uh, hugely intimidating, right? Like those are not keys, those are keys to a car I never thought I would get despite 25 years of trying to break into comics since 1997. Um, you know, you never really, you never think you're going to get that, the Corvette out of the gate. Right. But to me, that was Midnighter. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I, um, one of the first comics I read to get back in the comics was the authority and well, Midnighter is just a character that grew on me instantly. Um, and that run, like I said, just the way you brought him into the DC universe really made it its own run, his own story that seemed unique despite all the different quote street tier type characters around and then we see it get as extreme as and you want to talk about jobbers um naran my boy man the man once got bamboozled by lobo into learning a annoying song um when you have such crazy stories like midnighter god garden all that crazy story um what, what's it like for you on approach to, um, and, and you did reference this, so I kind of want to add this into it. You said you talk to Al pretty frequently about what he's doing. As a writer, how is it for you in terms of um, approaching a character, integrating a story while also trying to not tread on any other part of the tapestry of the universe in terms of what other people are establishing? Uh, I mean, you know, like you at least, I, I set out to never do that, right? You'll see me as someone who builds, uh, tries to build on what's come before, whether or not it's something that I would have specifically done. Like those are two different questions. But to me, once it's ratified in print, like our job is to, is to, uh, you know, enliven and build off that stuff. Because even if even the story you hate the most, as a creator or as a fan, I promise you, it's someone's favorite story. Uh, it's so, the beauty in storytelling, honestly. So, you know, like that, I, I try to do that. Um, but at the same time, you, uh, you have to tell the best story possibly for the characters you have your, you know, you're, uh, you're working with. So you talk to other creators where you can, and there's of course, editorial coordination that comes in with that as well. Uh, and, and that's, you know, when, when you have a great back and forth, a great relationship with an editor, that's when that really shines because they are the ones 
you know, keeping an eye, keeping a little spy cam on every book, letting you know what's going on, letting you know where you can maybe reference something to make it sh sh feel like a shared universe and so on and so forth. Or if you've accidentally stepped on someone's toes, uh, you know, they're there uh, when everything is singing right uh, and singing perfectly. They're there to let you know that and help you and help guide you to a way where everybody can win. That's a, that's a great answer. That's one I can definitely see the logic in as well as you know you're clearly someone that values respecting uh, the lore as well as just everything built up to that moment and i want to kind of have a fun question to kind of wrap this up in terms of just us getting our nerd bag right like just getting an honest answer from you, you are someone who has worked with a, a literal range of characters everything from a pseudo god who absorbs a god in scarlet witch all the way to midnight you know, Luke, my boy, Lucas Trent. With that being said, we mentioned, you know, the Corvettes in the garage that you got the right. Well, let's pretend I got that Disney money. I can bring Steve Orlando in to write whatever the hell I want because I own everything. What's what are some characters you would be like, man, I would love to dive into an adventure with that character. I would love to write a story around that character. What are your dream characters that like you wouldn't mind working with one day? Um, I mean, like, it's not a secret that I love the Inhumans. I've said it on this call. Uh, you know, so that's not even a surprise, but it's also not news at this point. So I feel like I got to give you more. But yeah, I would love to write the Inhumans. I love Black Bolt. I love the royal family. Um, I love the original Human Torch. I love all of Marvel's Golden Age, Marvel slash Timely's Golden Age characters. Um, but uh, let's see. Oh, and because it'll never happen for a variety of reasons. The, the the true Blue Sky characters, I would love to write Prime, though. I love the Ultraverse. Um, I was so into it. As a, uh, now, Prime and the Ultraverse stuff is locked up for a variety of issues, many of which are, are, are very legitimate. Uh, you know, one of which being that as much as I love Prime, one of his co-creator turned out to be like a felon and pederast. So, you know, fuck that guy. Um, but it also means if we ever brought the character back, that somehow he would have to get paid. So again, fuck that guy. I understand why Prime can't Yeah, no, back. I get that. But if you're asking, if you got a magic wand, hell yeah. I mean, I love that character. He was like my, I mean, he was huge for me as a kid. I got the Boris Vallejo poster hanging in my office of, 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 uh, of prime so that's got to be the answer because he's been one of my favorite characters since i was a kid if i had a magic wand i would uh vaporize jerry jones and 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 make sure that that character could excite uh, or rather uh could could wow uh and a whole new generation of people uh without him benefiting in any way but um i love that character and i love the cross gen characters especially mystic uh, I would love to work on that. I mean, one of my good friends is Ron Mars, so of course I'm connected to that now, but I was connected to it as a kid too. I was a day and date person with CrossGen. Um, so, you know, these may be not the answers other people give, but I love those characters. I love the world of Mystic. I love Prime. Uh, I mean, I, I love, I mean, a ton of Ultraverse characters and Ultraverse characters, but specifically that. And I'm sure I could ramble on, my friend. You know, like, I, I love the Witness from the 12. I think there's, like, unlimited storytelling potential there. I think he's amazing. Now, will he ever come back? Who knows? Um, but this list could run very long. I'm not mad at it. I, I love the uh, variants and answers I get from writer to writer. Um, just in terms of who they would roll with you, usually you get some obscure character you get someone people doesn't typically think of and for me um i probably would go more obscure just because there's certain characters like i had guilty pleasures of reading like section eight and dc defenestrator all them just just like weird random characters uh as well as characters like you said prime hasn't been used and i don't know how long so that's that's one I didn't even think of. Um, for you, as a writer, can you let us know? Because uh, I want all my subscribers to go check it out. What what upcoming projects do you have for us? What do the people get to look forward to soon? You've mentioned a couple of them. Curious, what else you got rolling? Oh, there's a lot. Uh, the, I mean, as you as you had, as you had said, um, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver starts in February. Uh, the collection edition for Astonishing Iceman and the second um, the second arc of Scarlet Witch is going to be out this spring. 
I have, man, there's just, uh, well, I'm doing Gotcha Man with Mad Cave right now. That's going to be out starting in the summer, I believe, or maybe late fall. We're very ahead on it. I have a young adult book called The Silver Vessels, uh, which is coming out as part of Mad Cave's Maverick line, their young adult line. It's my first young adult book. Um, I did a middle grade uh, book at Aftershock, uh, but not a young adult book. Um, I have Exorcist Never Die, which just hit the collected edition from Aftershock and is like the raid meets the exorcist. I'm super proud of that book. Sebastian Paris did incredible, incredible art on it. Um, what else? X-Men Unlimited is ongoing right now. We're doing, myself and Steve Fox are doing the parallel story to what's going on in Rise of the Power, uh, Rise, the Rise of, of, of X and Fall of X. Uh, sorry, I had to I had to get my rises with my power. With my yeah, falls. no, there's so uh, many so X rise. stories. I, I actually just rise covered the recent X. issue of Rise, and it's a crazy story. That shit, fucking. Yeah, crazy. it is. Uh, and I love that our, our our titles are getting un so unwieldy. It's like we're the Planet of the Apes franchise now. You know, it's really, <laughs> uh, but um, so that's coming out. Uh, I mean, and I'm sure there's more too. Like, uh, you you got to keep pretty busy in this business, um, but. The big thing is Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, and um, and whatever kind, and and the series that comes after it. Now I can't say what it is, but the press release did say that we're coming back later in the year. So we're doing four issues of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, and then it will be back for more. Uh, and for a preview of what's happening in there, as I said, you might look at the most recent issue of Timeless, which uh, flat out just tells you what's going to happen there. So uh, but how issue. we get there remains a mystery, and you'll uh, how we get there remains a mystery, and we'll and, and you'll see that in the book. That's amazing. Now, Steve, I, I know we're about to get out of here. I just want to thank you for coming on the channel. Been a fan of yours for years. Like I said, that Midnighter run is still one of the greatest runs I've ever read. Uh, I appreciate all you do. I know you deal with toxic fans. I hate to say it because I deal with it too. They'll never go away. They have a voice because they hide behind the screen. So it is oh, what it well, is. Look, I, uh... No, it really is. But honestly, I like... I don't that much anymore. It saddens me, but, you know, since I decided that I was, you know, only going to interact with folks I know on social, uh, life has been good, so I can't really complain. It's unfortunate, you know, that uh, folks can't handle, I guess, the responsibility of uh, access to us. Not everyone can, but that being said, like, there's so many ways to hear from me and every other creator, like this podcast right so uh it's not it hasn't really been an issue it's just been a repositioning of how we engage with the readership and um i think it's it's actually in a relatively healthy space because folks have every right to say whatever they want to say but that doesn't necessarily mean i need to hear it and so on and so forth or, or any of us do right we're just trying to make these books so uh yes they'll always be here but i think the equilibrium at least for the creators i know is is being approached hopefully that continues yeah, and I, I like, like I said, I had a great interaction with you. Um, I'm very thankful you came on here, um, and I'm looking forward to your continued work with Scarlet Witch and all your new projects uh, coming out. And again, anytime you want to come on the channel, uh, I'll probably be hitting you up after some of your more, uh, more of your stuff drops, just because we'll have more to talk about as well. Please do. Uh, Please do. And again, Al, Al, he ever wants to talk about Thor, I'm so down. But yeah, thank you so much for real for coming on here. It was great to have you. Long live Midnighter. Long live Scarlet Witch. And we'll see y'all later. Peace.